So what is it, what event was it that you specialised in? Um, so I did, I don't know, well, I did the ones, twos and fours. Right. So I liked doing 200, 100 was too short, 400 I was talented at. Right. And 200s really, but I didn't like 400s. I just did it because I was good at it. So what would you say was your, was your best one? You, for you personally, the one that maybe you were best at and you most enjoyed rather than... 200. 200. Um, so I'll kind of start from the beginning. What is it that got you into athletics? What was your, your big motivation or inspiration for it? I just enjoyed it. Yeah. I just enjoyed doing athletics. Um, running, I did it at primary school um, and never lost a race to the point that my mum never, my mum stopped turning up to the races because the mums would be like, she's gonna win this year and my mum was really embarrassed um, and yeah just really really enjoyed it and then on my leavers race, so year six leavers race which was a 200 meter grass, um, grass track that you were allowed to do, it's the longest run only year sixes are allowed to do and I beat all the kids by a long way so that my year six teacher actually rang up my mum because I came back and said to my mum like look I did this race why didn't you come she's like oh it's a bit embarrassing and I was busy blah 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 so like, that's fine I was like can I go to an athletics track and, and go to an athletics club everybody says I'm really good at it I was like mm, I'm not sure so I went back to my teacher and said, well, my mum said she's not sure. She rung my mum up and said, look, Holly has got a talent. Please take her down the running track. And for that summer holidays, I was on at my mum. Please, 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 please. Then a family friend knew an athletics coach in Andover, actually, um, George Williamson, and said, I'll take you down the running track, see what you've got, to the point that George was old school. He'd go, well, all these, all these kids think they're bloody talented. They're not. I was like, okay, <laughs> turn up. And actually, first training session, I think I beat, I think I beat all his girls. I think from there on, it was got a domino effect. Yeah. Was that um, George South African George? No, Different. George Williamson. So if right. you go down that athletics track um, in Andover now, he's got a little bench. Oh right. Um, because he died, oh. but he was he, he was a legend. I liked him because he didn't mince his words. Said it like it is. You think you're good? Come if I wasn't ever big-headed anyway. But if I for whatever reason decided to be cocky or give him some grief, it put me straight down, yeah. which is great. So it was year six. Was that when you joined <laughs> Andover? Yeah. So I was I had to be yeah eleven, eleven, twelve. So I just left. I just left. Primary school. And how long did you, well, that's a future question almost, but how long did you end up running for Randover until you decided to? Uh, well, so George, George died, um, and I didn't feel that there were coaches there that would look after me. So that was when I was 14. I didn't think I was gonna get looked after and was desperately trying to wrap my brains as to who would be a really good coach. And it just so happened, um, my next coach used to train, they came from Winchester and they used to train in Andover because Winchester didn't have a track. <clears throat> and I used to see them training just as I, starting to train as I would finish. And they had like really, they had men really in their group um, and talented, talented men within Hampshire and they had a few girls and one of the girls I knew from competing against I thought this is a good move I'm going to approach them and see if they coach me um, so then I went to them in Winchester they then decided to leave Winchester and as a group we went to Basingstoke right so <clears throat> at what age and at what point in your training did you think well I could make something of this I could, I could this could really go quite far I don't know. I don't know because it wasn't like I wasn't training for no. I wasn't training for any, you know, no reason. A lot of people would say, "Oh, you're going to do so well," and I just, for me, I was just I enjoyed it. 
I was good at it. There was something about when running, it's like the whole Forrest Gump loser line, but you know, I just enjoyed it. I, it gave me the, the endorphins that I've never had since and had that sense of enjoyment. I liked running fast. I liked that feeling. Um, and that's why I did it. I don't know. <clears throat> I started winning in my first season. I only lost one race and out of 38, yeah, 39 races, I lost one of them and that was because a girl got in my head and told me, oh, I've done this time, I've done that. But I didn't, I don't know, maybe, I think a lot older when I started to hit like break records, started getting offers in the door from like Nike and Adidas and then getting internationals, having a few people come up to me. So only when you started to reach that level did you start to believe that this is? Yeah, and even then, I, I'm just quite a level-headed person, like it, just take each time as it goes. You know, obviously the thought was, oh my God. I, and I had always, since a little girl, I'd always wanted to be in the Olympics but I didn't necessarily believe I could make it. I just thought, let's see how far this will go. I'm enjoying this. I'm loving it. Things are happening. They were happening at certain points really, really quickly and I couldn't believe how quick it was happening. So it was a dream rather than a goal <clears throat> at that point still? Yeah, and I think, I, I think non-stop. I think even until, even at the top of my game, it was still a dream, not a goal, because I was always bettering myself. It was all about PBs for me. It wasn't about, you know, there were certain things, like I wanted to win Hampshire schools. I wanted to break a Hampshire record then. Then I wanted to go and win the Southerns. From the Southerns, it was always little stepping stones. It wasn't like, I've won a race and now I'm gonna go to the Olympics. I just wasn't, I'm not that sort of person. Yeah. Um, so. So you went to Basingstoke after Winchester. Yeah. Uh, Basingstoke's not quite a good club, isn't it, for Yeah, for athletes. yeah. Um, so where, how did you, how did that, was that a big part in you being comfortable enough to push on to the next level, do you think? Um, or was it just your mindset? It, no, 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 but it wasn't. It was just turning up. I had a good group. When I went to training with John and Debs, it was a family. So I went up there to be social, prat about, have the boys like, prat about, have a laugh. Yes, we had to do training. I didn't really enjoy it, but it was just a matter of fact. It wasn't, I, yeah, I just, I didn't ever think about it. It sounds really silly, but I would just turn up and do what I had to do in training. And then when I would get to a race or the day of the race, then I would start thinking, right, this is what I've got to do and that mentality. Yeah. Um, I didn't ever think, oh, well, we had set goals, maybe we would speak about it. For the t amount of times I was training, maybe we'd talk about it every so often, but it wasn't a big pressure thing. It was right, well, you know you've got Hampshire schools coming up in four weeks, then you've got the Southerns, then you've got that. Other than that, it, it was quite relaxed, and, and that's the mentality I liked. Uh, so how many times did you train a week at, at base instead? Was it just the two, three? It, it gradually got built up the older I got. Um, John and Debs are brilliant coaches in the sense that they appreciated I'm a 14 year old girl and they had men in their group. Um, so it gradually built up and if I did turn up, so I was always doing Tuesday, Thursdays then and Sundays that were long distance Mondays that I did just some plyometric stuff and you know a few med ball work it wasn't it wasn't hard um, and then it progressed to maybe thinking about weight but I never until I went to uni had really lifted big ever um, we had just I used to do the bar and, and that was it 20k bar or sometimes 15k or 10k depending on what it was just to get the technique before we were going to do anything but it just so happened that I went then went to uni and decided to go to Loughborough um, before we kind of had that chance to really slowly break me in. Yeah. Uh, did you ever think 
I don't think I know the answer from your previous questions, but did you ever feel like it, it became your life training? Because yeah. being, being young, you're from Andover, right? Yeah. You were living in Andover at the time, yeah. and you were travelling to Basingstoke and doing all this training. How did that, how did that feel then, becoming such a big part of your life? It's not my life, I don't think. It was probably my identity. Right. So, I would walk in a street, you're the guy that runs. Oh, you're, you're the runner. How's it going? The first question anyone would ever ask me is like, oh, how's running going? So it wasn't, it just wasn't, it progressed into being life. But as I said, like training, I used to turn up and like the older boys, when we would be doing reps that I didn't particularly enjoy, one of them, one of them would fart and we'd have to run into it. So we would do like a rep hysterically laughing or, or we would mess about or we, it wasn't, it wasn't taken seriously. Yeah, we worked really, really hard, but it wasn't, very rarely did it feel like a routine. If it was, if there was any a point that I struggled, it would be in the winter. I'd be like, I don't want to do the long stuff. But then I would go there to go and see my friends and, and my family, you know, like my second family, my running family, who I still think of, you know, still think really highly of. So you, you obviously really enjoyed running and it was a, and you loved it almost. Was there ever a time during that training where you had a, it was, there ever had any negative impacts upon you? Yeah, if I was, if I got a twinge, you know, everybody gets them and I couldn't run or something hurt or thrown up every Sunday at Farley Mount, you know, I didn't particularly enjoy that. But then you'd have your friends around you to get to rally round, and I think that I didn't like training. I, and even though I was positive, like on the days of the race or any races, I would throw up violently, and I would convince myself, "Well, I've been sick. How the hell am I supposed supposed to go and now sprint?" And it was nerves, and I didn't realise that at the time. Um, and then my family would just rally round, you know, don't worry, well, just see how you go. If you lose, it doesn't matter. So I had a really positive, um, you know, inner circle around me so that if I was any negative energy that I sometimes, you know, naturally would have, it used to be fizzled out. <laughs> just get on with it. Just shut up, get on, go, go down the track and sort it out. <laughs> One thing I find quite interesting is I spoke to um, a girl called Holly Mills. She's yeah. a seventeen-year-old from Andover. She hopes she got quite good potential. Yeah. Um, and one thing I found quite interesting is that obviously she had two separate groups of friends. So she has her friends from college and yeah. stuff like that, and then she's got her running friends. Yeah. And she's telling me that there's quite a big difference between them because sometimes her friends from her from college don't necessarily understand her having to go out and train most yeah. days and stuff like that. Did you ever find that, that you were ever leaning towards your running friends because they could understand you more? No, because I, once again, I've got, you know, my friends that I've got, they are always understood. What would be hard is, and I'm sure Holly's at that really at hard age, is she se 17, 17 yeah. yeah. So she's really at that hard age when, when she hits 18, it's the hardest because all your friends are going out on the boozer and you're saying, I can't. And they're like, why? Well, because on Sun you know, if they're going on the booze on Friday, well, I've got a race on Sunday. Well, you're not doing anything tomorrow, so what's the problem? Well, I can't, because I need to get an early night. Well, why? And, and, and it would be, it wasn't my best friend, so I didn't really care. As far as I was concerned, when they would say it, they'd only say it to me a few times, because <laughs> they'd get shot down. <laughs> I would go, well, it, that's how it is. I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm not going out. Um, but for me, then I'd sit at home and I'd be like, my friends are out. I'm in bed. I have to get to sleep because uh, sleep deprivation works in 48 hour periods. So if you don't get a good night's sleep on Friday, your performance on Sunday wouldn't be as good. Um, but you'd be, sitting, I'd be in bed and I'd be thinking, oh, come on, like, wonder what my friends are doing now, like, but, but then when it would, I'd be a little bit gutted, and then on Sunday, if I performed really well, I'd be like, well, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, so you then went to Loughborough University. What is it you went there to do? Is there a certain course or was it? Yeah, so sports and business management. Um, 
but UKA had strongly, strongly, strongly advised that you had to go to five universities if you wanted to potentially be seen to get into the squads or be funded. I think they were, and they were the five choices that I picked to go to uni. Um, I didn't even consider any other ones. Uh, that was Bath, Bur Bath, Birmingham, Loughborough, St Mary's, and Brunel. Right. But Brunel wasn't seen as necessarily the best one to go to because that. It, I think if I had my choice again, I'd probably stick to Brunel. Was um, was Loughborough your first choice at the time? It was. Yeah, just because um, UKA were based in Birmingham, but I knew that they were going to go up to Loughborough. Um, I knew that there was quite high profile coaches um, that had come up to me, offered me scholarships, money. Um, I knew that athletes there, some of them were my friends that I'd been on the squads with. So it was kind of a no brainer, <laughs> brainer to me. Well, I say no brainer, it was really hard to leave John and Debs, but I did get the promise of the coach um, that he would follow John's training, but he would look after me and just oversee it, but that didn't materialise. Because Love was quite famous for, for sport in general, but it does produce a lot of quite well, well known athletes really, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so how difficult, because you go to a, you, when you go to university, you're 18 years old. Yeah. It must be a big thing. Was there trials and stuff that you had to do to get into the running team, or was it just you almost turn up in a way? I I will. I, they, know, I was, I was lucky. Were. I was lucky. I right. just went straight into first squad. Um, I presume at that point, then that must have been you must have been struggling for time. I guess in terms of doing your course work and then also your running side. Yeah. Being at that age where university, a lot of it is about this whole drinking culture and going out, make, meeting a lot of new people. Did it ever get difficult for you so that you couldn't do one of those? Loughborough was, it turned on its head. So where it was chilled before and I had a really good family structure around me, I went up to university, was put in with Nick Dakin's group. Nick Dakin told me, who was the head, head coach of Loughborough, who oversees all of the, all of the training groups in the sense of there might be quite a few UKA people, but they have to run everything by Nick to find out when they can use the track, when they can do that. So I went into his group because he asked me, he basically spoke to me on the phone and really, he headhunted me. So he was really positive. He was like, come up to Loughborough, I will speak to you, I will show you these things. I went there and I was like, okay, so I've been training in John's shed doing weights there's now power base. There is all of these things, there are all my friends here, this is massive. <clears throat> he was really quite light-hearted and, and I really liked that for me. So then I went into Loughborough, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I honestly did not know what I was getting myself into um, because I then walked in and he said to me, you're not going to halls. He was like, I'm not having a member of my squad go into halls. Um, you are to go into accommodation straight away with other athletes. Turned out those athletes weren't very good, very nice. One of them was my competitor, which for me didn't make any difference, didn't really matter, because it's all about me when I step on the line. It's not about her. Um, I got quite badly bullied. Um, really badly bullied actually and then um and training stepped up so i wasn't going to university to go on the boozer to do this i was going there to actually probably let's see if i can make it it wasn't i didn't think straight to the olympics but it was like let's see this is the next step up this is a top coach in uka wanting you you need to step up your game and my god training was hard um we'd go out now and again but not not a lot i had to i never thought about my diet 
um, had to think about that. I had to have skin fold tests to find out how fat I was. Um, I was told that I wouldn't be able to eat certain things at certain times, like a baked potato at seven o'clock. Um, training, yeah, training was intense and actually probably, no, definitely, my academics got neglected. But I went up to Loughborough really to start to make it rather than academically. So that must have been all that stuff. You're still quite young at the time. That must have been at times quite overwhelming. Did you ever, did you ever question whether this was what you wanted to do in that, maybe in that first <laughs> year? No, because I think the first year is like a whirlwind, didn't it? You just, got, I just kind of got caught up in it and powered on. I'm not some a person that just because I'm struggling for the first six months, am I going to quit? No, I power through and I make this work. Training was still going, was going well, but it was just a different mentality out there. You know, I was turning up to the track and in the group <laughs> with people that didn't muck about girls that maybe had makeup on for training, which I don't understand. Um, <clears throat> I had, you had to be on your A game every day. You know, normally at, back in Basingstoke, I would turn up and think, oh, I feel like crap. I feel like crap. Never mind. It's one in the bank. And I would do, I couldn't tell you that this is a hilarious thing. I couldn't tell you any times that I did in training at all. And John would, John would go, so that's a quick time I go, oh, okay, <laughs> like, I can walk off. But it didn't matter, because in training, who cares? Whereas then, when I went to Loughborough, everything was about timing, you know, hitting the correct times. I'd never kind of had to focus on hitting a time in training. If I had five reps, I had to hit it on that second, because if I didn't hit that second, everything would be thrown off. So it was, it was just, it was so hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so when did you, you were talking about being headhunted and stuff like that. When did you first get your first big kind of scholarship or your first deal? Um, well, I was always getting grants from Hampshire. I was really lucky. Um, I did, I won like Hampshire sports, junior sportswoman of the year in, 2013 so I was getting I was getting recognition but it, like I said it was like slow it never was like it never went wrong until maybe 2007 was maybe a breakthrough through year but at that point I'd still represented England at the like ISF world championships I'd still gone and I hadn't won English schools at that point I think I'd won nationals <clears throat> but maybe for the materialistic side, 2007, because I started winning internationals, Adidas, <laughs> it was funny because, uh, who, who rejected me first of all? I wanna say ASICS, and that was before ASICS had just kind of really hit it big. They rejected me, and then I think the week later, or a couple of days later, I then went and won Loughborough International, which then Nick saw and then wanted me for that year. <clears throat> and then Adidas, Nike, obviously the headhunters for them were all about, they were offering me different bits and pieces. I went with Adidas just because they were the first people that said, look, do you want to, do you want to be on our books? Will you wear our kit? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> like, I'm not going to say no, um, even though Nike, I think their, their letter came like a week later or not even that, a couple of days later, but I was like, well, you go with the first person that you're given. Actually, I liked Adidas, I liked the guy, um, and then, yeah, I got, like I went on Hampshire Now magazine, I went on radio, I went on, it was just the more the non-athletic side, really, that right. maybe if, it, if that counts as being... The, the biggest step or, or whatever, but I don't know. Was it, did it ever be, become hard to stay grounded? Because if you get letters from things like, from companies like Adidas and Nike, that's quite a big thing. Like, that doesn't happen to your everyday person and people are asking you to come and train with them. Did you ever think, 
you not brought up that way. No. Doesn't matter who you are, like everybody. You are who you are, I, I, and I and I feel the same. Like if I was to meet, it's nice to know or meet a celebrity or brilliant. Like it's really cool to meet them, and I would be really excited. But at the end of the day, there's they're still the same person. Like they've still been brought up. Like my family, if I behaved in any way that was big headed or thought I was the dog's bollocks or showed off, oh. Uh, my family would 100% ground me, and and the friend, my friends. I'm I've not been brought up that way. Actually, I hate those people. I I think that I just each time I felt like I tell you what that is one big feeling is the first lot of Adidas kit. It came in a box, and I'm ki not kidding you. Me and my mum could fit in this box, and at this point, like it. You know, my mum had been brilliant with me, but they didn't have loads and loads of money. So I, ha my first, my first pair of spikes were high techs, and they were in the sale because they were the only ones we could afford. And I would turn up to the track, and they, all these girls would have Adidas and Nike kit, and I'd look at them and go, "Wow, I would just really want that." And then we'd have to go to the sale and get like high gear, high gear stuff. And so when. When I got that first box, like I didn't, it didn't really register. I just thought, oh, Adidas has sent me a few things, so like ask for my details, and then within, I think the day later, like it, it was huge. Like this box turned up, and me and my mum opened it, and there were like five pairs of trainers, five pairs of spikes, like all the brand new kit that hadn't even been like, oh no, it was the old season and then I got the other new season stuff before anyone else. And we just tried it on, we were like screaming in the room, so excited, like, oh my God. And I didn't, I was just like, aren't I, I'm so lucky. I am so lucky, I'm a lucky girl. I didn't think, oh God, I've made it. Like, I was just lucky. I was fortunate that they thought, they saw something in me and hopefully I could do it. So, oh, that must have been pretty surreal because you, well, you get free stuff, it's pretty good anyway, but to be all from Adidas, that's quite um, Yeah, quite I used to be lucky. It, how cool is it? I think this is the coolest thing, is that I, I rang them up. I hadn't asked when I got to Loughborough, actually, because everybody was sponsored at that point. Well, I say everybody, but there's a lot of GB in there. They're like, you do realise you can message them? Because I said, oh, I'm freezing. I think we were doing it in the winter season. I was really quite cold. My, they were saying, well, why don't you just get a coat? And I was like, I haven't got the money to afford to get a coat. Because my gran had helped me as well. I got a scholarship, but just like living wise, my gran said that she would help me with food and stuff like that. She said, I haven't got the money to. I'm like, sponsored by Adidas, aren't you? I was like, yeah. I like, just asking for a winter coat. So I, I was like, okay. So I, I think I text saying like, Hi Ashley, like is there any chance that I can please have a, a, a coat for training because I'm quite cold? The very next day then it ended up like I got three new pairs of trainers, thermal socks, like a gilet and a coat. I still wear it to this day. I love that coat. Like a warm winter coat, gloves, like you name it for anything in the winter. Headbands, wristbands, like everything. I got everything I was like... <laughs> that was pretty cool. That, it's, that's, yeah, that's it's lovely, really cool, isn't it? Isn't it? Just How lucky! Asking for free stuff and it comes <laughs> But I just it, didn't so. ever think like I could do it. I just didn't like. I was just like, oh my god. And then I thought, right, that's being really cheeky that I've asked him for that. Like, don't ask him anything unless you need it, because other people would go, yeah, don't. He's have had five wears out of them, or they're a bit muddy. I like ni nice, clean trainers, and I think like you're training in them. So what's the point? So I wouldn't necessarily ask, but I'd just get given it. Yeah, so. I, I think I'd be a bit like you and Zadlu. Even though you've got that capability, it's like, <coughs> well, I don't need it, kind of. From yeah, point. Yeah, I, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, just, yeah. So when did you first represent, I say England, but you've mentioned that. When did you first represent Great Britain or have the opportunity to? Great Britain was 2007. So after the Loughborough International, or the... Bedford International, I got, it was a European, so it was a, yeah, so I had Loughborough big, then I went Bedford International Games. 
Um, and then it was the uh, it was the trials for under twenties. Bear in mind, I was the youngest in the squad because the way athletics works, it was like if you. So I'm born on the sixth of December. If I and the year that I was born, not so. <laughs> Oh girl, 1989. If I was the 1st of January, 1990, I would have three years in, in like under 17s. Oh no, it's under 17s. I got the first one. Under, no, under 20s. It was under 20s because I just turned 17 and I had to be put in. So everybody was kind of almost, some of them were about two and a half years older than me. Um, so I'd done all right and we'd done the 200 meters I'd been focusing on the 200 meters and the week before we thought right we're throwing a 400 meters because I was 0.3 I was three hundredths or two, two hundredths of a second off of the qualifying time for the Europeans so we knew I was in quite a good stead so my coach said this before I went up to Loughborough in 2007 said look let's do a 400 meters he said because if you can do an all right time he said it, you're more likely to get in the squad um so we went to sevens because i'd done i had done a 400 meters the year before but only <laughs> but actually the first time i ever did a 400 meters in my life was at the isf world championships if we're in england i don't even know how i managed it i didn't really know what i was doing so we, but we hadn't i just went out and ran didn't have a clue whereas 400's tactical you know you need to know what sort of runner you are so my coach said to me on in 2007 right you did an all right time last year let's see if you can just dip under i think dip under i think i did 56 seconds he said look dip on if you can dip into 55 high he said i think you're going to go and you'd be able to go into the relay team or they would think actually we'll take holly because not only is she close to the qualifying time for 200 meters she's done an all right 400 um and then we went to sevens and then i <laughs> I did the I did the heat I did all right and then John sort of said to me well you know you've got to run it this way I didn't really know what I was doing anyway I just ran it and then did 54-2 ranked myself first in the UK broke the southern record and he was a bit like <laughs> and I just finished and I was like I don't really know what I did and he was like You've just broken, I think I, the record was like stood for like 20 years, something, somewhere around, it could have been higher or lower, like 20 years. He's like, I was like, uh, okay. So he's like, we've well, got the qualifying time for the 400 now. But I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. So actually I, then I went to the trials and I did the 200, got, got the qualifying time for the 200 again, uh, got the, qualifying time for the 200 but came second um so it gb rang me up <laughs> on the way back from queen queen mary's at college and was like uh yeah so what do you want to do the 200 or the 400 like we'd prefer you to do the 400 we've got no other people selected for it i was like uh, uh, my god i don't know um and then I went, I went off and did the 400 because I think we, we just thought, well, I've got a chance. Um, and then, yeah, so I went off to Hengelo, Hengelo in 2007, the youngest in the squad. So I was only 17 and I was the youngest in the squad and there were people that were just that year going to be turning 20. So I was, I was, that was, that was weird. that was so overwhelming, that was weird. That must have been, I suppose, scary in a way, but also, well, how did it make you feel when you got that call and you, well, you knew you were going to go and represent Great Britain, how, how did that make you feel as... I was so excited, person? I just got off the, I, <laughs> I finished the phone, I was like, oh, the people on the bus were like, because at this point, because I'm, so I'm not Andover, I'm Hurstbourne Prize. 
and I think I was by myself. Like, so if, unless I know people, I'm quite a quiet person. If I, if you know, but if you know me, I'm loud and annoying. But I was quite quiet, and I come off the phone, and I think there was a couple of people at the back of the bus, and they were like, "What was that phone call, Holly?" Because I think I had to answer a few things. I was just like got selected for, for Great Britain, like, what is going on? I rang my mum up, my mum's screaming, like, get inside, same thing as the whole Adidas thing, was screaming away, and then just r rung up, and then it was, like, within two weeks, not even that, I was, like, in, no, it wasn't even, yeah, two weeks, and then I'm in Holland, and I'm, like, what, doing the 400 metres, after randomly doing a 400 metres at the south of, south of England, I was just, how have I ended up here? Like, <laughs> so how many times did you go on to, um, I don't know if you know the exact number, but how many times did you go on to represent Great Britain at, at different stages, at different ages? Different... I did every single year, I did every single competition I could, and I did it for every single year until I was 21. So you had four years of... Yeah, every, years. any any competition there was, any GB selection, whether they were big internationals or small internationals, I got selected. Um, a couple of those were senior, senior call-ups, even though I was still like under 23s, which was quite cool. That was another big step was, you know, okay, you've been doing it for the juniors, but getting called up for seniors was massive for me because I was like, well, you can be the... I'd always had that mentality, like, you can be the best you can be, but unless you're hitting the hit seniors, don't really count. You're still competing against juniors, you have to be an adult. And then I got called up a couple of senior, they were senior England, I don't, yeah, seen, or did I have a senior? I don't think I had a senior GB, I think I had senior England, but I, that was so cool to me. So what, at what age do you think you were at the top of your game? You were at your, your very best? I don't know. I don't know because it... Was there ever a time that your, your form or, or your time it ever dipped off at all during the... Yeah, because I was getting injured. So I, I had injuries from since I was a little girl. Um, so okay, it might have dipped off but it wasn't in my head it wasn't necessarily my fault but actually until I went up to Loughborough everything was always progressing up it was only until Loughborough that I kind of it 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 went to pop really um yeah so so what age was it was it um the injuries was it always the same injury or was, was similar injuries or was it Sort of something different. You no, know. so you get twinges, like I said, you just uh, just have to rest it. Um, the main one was my back. So my back, my back caused issues even when I was a little girl. So, like even when I was 14, 13 or 14, I did a race in Radley and the wind was really bad. And I was the last race on, and I think it was 150 meters. I did it, and I, I um, pulled my back, and I couldn't even get in the car. But then after a couple of weeks, that was fine. Um, and then I was getting, I had like groin injuries throughout the whole of my career. Like even like when I was a little girl, just running, I, I was always injured. But I think that's the nature of sprinting. Um. So, am I right in thinking that it was injuries or a injury that kind of stopped you then running? Yeah. What What age was that? What's it, what age did you stop? <clears throat> well, so I'd have to look on the power of 10, but I think I, my last race, my last ever race was, um, was Bucks and it was a test event for London 2012, so it had to be tw 2012. So it was... June 2012, it was a couple of weeks before the, the Olympics and I'd, I'd still been injured but I thought oh actually and that was the, it's the injury that I still have I thought oh I'll give it a go because I've never I really wanted to compete 
in the Olympic Stadium and be in a test event, but I shouldn't have done it. So that it looks, if you have a look on the power of 10, that I have all the, all the stats on any athlete who's competed, who's like registered with England athletics, you can see my, my sometimes you can see my times drop down. That's from injury. Right. What what was what was the big injury that was the end? So it's it's this injury and I don't know what it is still. So I've gone through so much but um and I've had an operation on my foot but they thought it was um I had a gro uh, a bone spur in my foot but we didn't know that. All all that was happening was I was warm weather training in Spain. I was going, this it keeps hurting, my foot kept hurting and I didn't know why I was putting like a golf ball on it, rolling it round because I just thought, just felt like pressure and it was quite tight. Then the more it was happening, it was, you know, once a week after a hard session, then it would be twice a week and then it progressed on to the point that when I was at Bucks, I was in pain running. I was in massive pain running. Um, and then I just decided I can't, this can't happen because I was walking down the street and my foot would flare up. It still flares up now. Um, and then I started going and seeing, um, going and seeing physios at this point beforehand, the year before I'd been massively injured as well because I had my back, um, I had a bulging in my, and a tear in my disc, um, in my L5 S1 which meant that Nick, the coach who said he'd look after me, didn't look after me. So I ended up coach hopping and then my back, then my, my knee and all, all of like, I think my quad started hurting and my IT band and then my foot. So it was, it was weird. I don't feel like, I know my foot is the reason now that I've stopped, but actually my body was falling apart. <laughs> Um, so you must have, I would assume, because you've, you've done so well up to that point, I assume probably try to carry on yeah. with your injuries. Yeah. I would guess. How, how long did you then try and carry on training and competing for? Well, with my foot, I couldn't. So the Bucks, I, I carried on. So we went warm weather training at Easter. And... Then I went to Bucks and convinced myself that I would be okay because I put in some solid training. It was only kind of the final 10 days that that had started to hurt um, in Spain. Then I think Bucks was a couple of weeks later, but I couldn't do stuff. So, I, And then I stopped competing, but I would carry on training and it was just hurting more and more and more. And then I graduated and came back. I think I went to try and see John and Debs and try and train with them. It just wasn't happening. Um, so yeah, it just it just fizzled out, just the way it is. So then, so you must have then had to make a decision that you said, well, I can't do this anymore. How, well, it's a cliche question, but how did that make you feel? How did that, did that have a big impact on you? Because running was such a big part of your life before that and for so long. Yeah. How did you then feel knowing that I've actually got to stop doing something that I really love. The identity for me was a massive thing and it was like the money that I had been given by people so I never thought, <laughs> it sounds really stupid but I always thought that it was like I had this talent, I had to look after it like, and I kind of felt like maybe the decisions that I made certainly in Loughborough that wasn't the right decision and I didn't know that but I had I felt pressure on me to try and get back into it because like it's ha it, this is awful and I always still feel guilty but there was at this point I kind of Adidas would still give me some stuff because I knew a few people and they liked me and I was lucky but I felt like I shouldn't I also and then Nick stopped giving me a scholarship on my final year, so then we had to find find fund that. Um, I was getting injured with my back and stuff like that, so actually, I was really lucky. But my family would always fundraise, so 
any money that I was given. So this is why I never ever thought it was me. I, you know, I had Holly, the Holly Croxford running fund. So any, we ran it like a business. So I never had money, like anything I was given. And we were, my family were always aware that we had to keep drumming up the money or otherwise I couldn't train. Like my parents didn't have enough money to drive me to Basingstoke each time. So we'd have to fund money and, and, and stuff like that. And um, women um, died and she decided to, instead of flowers at her funeral that she would put money into me. At this point I was injured. I didn't want, I did not want that money because I couldn't produce, like I still feel guilty now that at, I see their sons and one of them was a year older than me, that their mum didn't have flowers at their funeral because she ploughed money, she gave money to me and I didn't waste it and I really tried, but I, I couldn't compete. So, I, and I felt, in that sense, like I would let people down. But actually now on reflection, it, it wasn't me. I tried my best, like, it's really sad and it's really gutting, but it is what it is. Like, I, the amount of times that I got poked, prodded, you know, had to go to physio, have black bruises all on my body from them trying to fix me and manipulate me to crying like, oh my God, it was, just it was mad and I just think well could I have given it any more <laughs> no I, I couldn't you know I even after I finished running and then came back home at 20 22 I was working and I was paying money to and investing my own money into trying to get to work out what my foot was what was going on with my foot and I was going to the Hampshire Clinic I ended up going to London um, well, I saw James Calder, so he works with um, professional footballers and the Royal Ballet, I think. And he was really stunned as to what was going on. Um, so he said, look, I'm pretty big in the business. I don't really know what's going on. We've done CT scans, we've done an MRI, we've done x-rays, we've done, put some stuff in my foot to work out what had gone on and numbing it and weird stuff he said look we need to go have a dis disciplinary council where the best in the business are there and I have to explain my symptoms and even they didn't know what was going on I think it's at that point that you think well <laughs> what more is there that you can do I, well I and then after that he went the only other option is I open you up I open your foot up and I don't know what I'm looking for but I'm just going to have a look and see what's a problem. And that's when they found the bone spur and then detached my post hip um, and then sewed me back together, hoping it would be better. But he said the scar tissue could be just as bad as that bone spur. Um, and I think after, I, when you think about it all and I think of all the years that I had different stuff with my back, getting manipulated, I had sciatica, like all this stuff, and I got injured. It's just the way it is. I mean, you must, you probably wouldn't have realised necessarily at the time, but did you ever think, or, did, or looking back at it now, were you ever in a kind of worse mental state in that you were a bit sad all the yeah. time? Yeah, so I massively got depressed. Really, really, really badly depressed. Um, things weren't working out for me in my second year of uni. I was getting whether this was, I think the main fact was I was getting bullied. So I was getting bullied by actually the girls up in GB and the girls that I was competing against. So I've always been the person that, if you beat me on the line, I'll shake your hand because you're the better person. They won't do that necessarily. They will bully you on and on and on and on. And I had one girl in particular who bullied me on and on and on and on. Um, I got injured. Nick as a coach was awful that this is when I actually had my back and I had the I'd had sciatica the year before that had been better and then he had done so many weights with me and weight sessions that were lasting three or four hours from a kid that couldn't was just lifting bars a couple of years before I got majorly injured and couldn't do anything I was up in Loughborough I was getting bullied um 
I just felt really isolated and really down and I was losing my identity because I couldn't even go and do what I loved because I, I'm injured and I'm away from all that support unit and everything like that. Oh, it's awful. Absolutely awful. Um, yeah, really bad. And how long, well, you may, may never get out of that state sometimes, but yeah. how long do you think it took you to get to the point where you could accept that you were now having to do something else with your life, you were going to have to move on? How long did that take? Or you might I think it, I, I tell you what, it was more about fixing my head more than anything. So I was depressed, I was down, I couldn't trust my mind. There was a, so much that had happened that, as I said, everything kind of spiralled so quickly. And then all of a sudden it kind of then came to a head. I was like, shit, what's going on? And, and I couldn't figure out. I thought I was a bad person, I think from the bullying. I thought I was a bad person. I'd taken this woman, this woman had left this money to me. I was now injured. I was getting bullied saying I was fat, I was this, I was this. And I had to go back home. I ended up doing four, four years at university because on my second year, I was so ill that I decided to come back home and get myself right, mentally right because everything was negative. I'm such a positive person now, and I get it, and actually what happened was the making of me. But, oh God, it was so hard. And I think for me, I then went back up to uni after getting bullied so badly. You wouldn't believe how badly bullied I was and how injured I was, and getting bullied actually by the coach. Um, and getting spoken to that actually it wasn't it was about me sticking it to people and going back up and maybe not necessarily making it as a career but take going back to the basics and going you know what let's enjoy some stuff again let's enjoy going out let's go and train let's because at one point I couldn't even go out of the house to train I couldn't the thought of going out when you I guess when you're depressed the thought of going out is horrible. Like, you, I couldn't leave, I was sleeping all the time, I couldn't leave my bedroom, I wasn't going to one of my lectures. So then when I came back, it was just about kind of pushing myself, that little step. So if I couldn't get to uni, it would be get out the house, get out and do the next step. So then my mentality kind of changed and went back to who I was anyway and just, little baby steps each time. So then when I got injured again, it was like, well, it is what it is. Part of me did feel guilty and st still does for certain things, but actually it was out of my control. I couldn't do any more. And um, looking back on it now, so looking back at your whole career, do you have any big regrets? Or anything you would necessarily, <clears throat> something you would do differently? I don't think you should because it makes you who you are. But on a take out anything else in life and just to be a successful athlete and to have made it, not gone to Loughborough. Not gone to Loughborough. Not potentially have gone to Brunel. But even then, I just think so many people got injured. You know, I. I would have probably have been drawn to go to Linford Christie's group and train with them. All of those have got injured. I think that if if I had to stop it <laughs> and I would have done it and I would have decided, right, I'm going to put my full heart into it and only athletics and not my academics and not got drawn in and know what I know now, I would have stayed with John. And I think if you interview Kieran, he'll say the same. Yeah. He'll, he'll say it. And if he doesn't, then he's silly because actually I can see it from like, from everything that's happened to me, his coach, is, uh, John, and his dad, he's bloody amazing. He's such a good coach. Yeah. What, why is that? Why? Is there anything specific? I don't know. I just think he's really good. I think he does his research, so they're mad on it. And I think that he's not recognised at all. He's not a big name. He doesn't bum lick UKA, so he's not got the recognition that he should. There's a load of brown noses in athletics. It's all about brown nosing, and if you if you can't fit, if your face doesn't fit, 
then you're not going to be successful. But actually, John's bloody amazing. And just finally, because I'm oh, sorry, this is dragged on a bit, but I'm, I'm very interested <laughs> in listening to you. Um, I'll go back to I spoke to Holly Mills. Being from your position where you're able to reflect on it now for, for a few years, what advice would you give for someone like Holly who's hoping, probably had the same goals and dreams as you did when she was, when you were her age and that she wants to go on and she, she obviously the end goal being the Olympics and stuff like yeah. that. What advice would you have to her in the, in the hopes that she doesn't get caught up in, in what, what possibly can happen and, and be in your time and that, all that kind of I thing? I don't know, because I'd have to meet Holly, I haven't met her before. I don't know what her mentality is like. Like some people you would say, like if you interview, don't get caught up in, uh, in the materialistic side of athletics. But I never, I don't know, but I didn't feel like I was, so that wasn't an issue. I've always been level-headed. It wasn't looking at all the bravado and what I was getting, it was just how athletics made me feel. So I don't know, but I don't know her if she's not, she's very confident. I, I wasn't like that, I was just level-headed. But maybe if she's thinking about, you know, which you have to do, if she's thinking about academics and, and what she's going to do after, if everything doesn't pan out, right, and she wants to go to university, do research. You know, it's not necessarily about how profile the coaches are and the athletes you're going to be training with, but actually how they're going to cater to you, how they're going to, are they going to look after you? I think that's probably the biggest thing is who, when you go anywhere, who's going to look after you? And what are their intentions with you? Are you going to be another, just another face in a group? Or are you, they going to genuinely care about you and look after you? And then I think if you've got a good little circle around you, that's the main thing, is a big support unit, because that was for me. So if you, if you could go and s go back in time and speak to your, say, 15, 16 year old self, what, what would you say to her in that, to try and? Are we talking for, to be successful? Or are we talking in general? Because I wouldn't, I'm one of these people, I'm an annoying person that I won't change what happened to me because I like to think I'm a good person and maybe and everything that's happened to me has molded me to who I am now and I'm quite proud of that but if I was to speak to my 15 well my 17 year old self and say or oh, eight well, yeah 17 18 and say if you want to be in the Olympics then I'd probably tell her not to go to university but then something else could have happened and I could have still you know these injuries could have still happened so you would you wouldn't do anything you you in a way I get the feeling that you want them to experience it for themselves rather than someone tell them to so say you were back in that position you wouldn't want someone to tell you how to live your life so you get to a certain point you'd rather just experience it and go through what you've got to go through to, yeah. to I, make it to a good I level. mean, I, for me, I feel like I'm a happier person than I would be if I was to be the top athlete in the UK. That being said, if you gave me the opportunity to run again, I'd take it in a heartbeat because I like the feeling. But am I a happier, more content person now than I was before? Yeah, massively. Like, in athletics, you're never happy, and I think that if you speak to anyone competing, and it would have been be really good if you can speak to Holly again. If you speak to her and find out, like, is she necessary? Is she happy with getting a PB? Will she run up, walk off the line, going yay? Probably for five minutes, and then the next thing is, oh, next week I've got a race. It was a bit windy. Oh, the weather wasn't cold. It was a bit cold oh, I was a bit tired, I didn't get to sleep, all of these things. And then, then you're back to square one. You have to be thinking, right, next week I'm going to go for this. And then I think it maybe transpires, and it is a lot for most athletes, is that it transpires into your life. Like, so you'll be obsessed. Like a lot of people, they're all materialistic. I, I, I wasn't, I was lucky. 
but they're going by a car and they'll be like, yeah, well, next year I'm going to get a bigger car and a better car. And I think that that's what happens. So, yeah. Oh.